Basically, the problem with Russia was its intelligentsia, which was utterly maximalist, um, utterly utilitarian, uh, and believed in all these big words like you know liberalism or socialism, but never had any concept of what liberty was for, and, and was completely ungrounded in any set of particularly religious values. Join the best in the movement. It's conservative conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo Slayback and Tom Saroof. Our guest today is Dr. Paul Robinson, who is a professor at the University of Ottawa. Paul, thanks for joining the podcast. My pleasure. And to start, we'd love to hear who you are, where you come from, what your background is, and uh, anything about yourself that you'd like to share with our listeners. Yeah, I teach in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. My, my speciality is um, primarily Russian and Soviet history, but I've also written on, on defense policy, defense ethics, and, and so on. I was, many eons ago, I was a, an officer in the British Army and then um, went into academia um, and have written um, a bunch of books on uh, Russian and Soviet history, and more, most recently on um, intellectual history. So that's uh, a book, Russian Conservatism. Uh, the latest one is entitled Russian Liberalism that came out in, in September. And um, I just submitted another one, the final manuscript of a, another one called Russian Civilizationism to, to the publisher, which will be out, um, I guess, probably about 12 months from now, given the general pace of academic publishing. Hey there, listener. I wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission here at ISI is educating for liberty. If you'd like to join us in fulfilling our mission, consider helping us by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Now, back to the show. Well, excellent. And our listener question for you, Paul, is, since you are maybe if originally not originally from Canada, but live and teach in Canada now, um, even though your specialty is in Russian conservatism, our listener wants to know what you think of the state of conservatism is in Canada currently. Well, I I I, I would probably say that um, you know what what is the, called conservatism here should be the Conservative Party of Canada primarily um, would probably be considered. Reasonably liberal in, in the United States, I think. <laughs> I think that the, the general, um, you know, to be a conservative is, is very situational, right? So it, um, it what you're trying to conserve or, um, would vary from society to society. So um, a, a Canadian conservatism is probably more liberal or progressive than, than an American one. We, you know, until a few years back, even had a progressive conservative party of Canada. So <laughs> that gives you an idea of things things where things relatively stand you know people think the current leader of the conservative party pierre polyevre is, is super scary but i don't think he would would be considered bad in the united states and so perhaps uh to shift to the the meat of our our discussion um is a subject that you dedicated sounds like most of your life's professional work to um and we recently actually had the centenary of Lenin's death. I think this was a few weeks ago. So we're recording on February 1st right now. Um, but uh, obviously Lenin was a leader who ushered in a near century of political terror, uh, famine, poverty, um, and other horrors that uh, would follow the Bolshevik seizure of power in the early 20th century Russia. So I'm glad you can join us um, today for that timely reason, but also because probably the best book that I read um, in 2023 was um, A People's Tragedy by Orlando, I, I'm actually not sure how to pronounce his last name, um, Figus, Fijus, um, the, it, you might be able to pronounce it, but I, I haven't been able to find the correct pronunciation, but um, it was, before that, I, I read that book, which is a tome, you know, it's probably 900 or so pages. Um, I hadn't really understood the full historical climate, so um, you know, like the seemingly complacent attitude of, of Tsar Nicholas um, in the in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And that, that you know, that whole um, that that ad that attitude towards leadership that Imperial Russia had was, I think, what eventually seemed to have led to the rise of someone like Lenin. So for conservatives, especially 
you know, obviously me and Tom are American, we're recording from the U.S., um, the rise of the Soviet Union as a world power and the, the prospect of global communism was the condition that Cold War conservatism, especially in the U.S., um, really seemed to take root and became its own movement. And so understanding this period uh, is really fundamental for us, um, especially, you know, working at ISI, we um, so, sometimes we, we actually run into, um, you know, like someone like George Nash, who uh, anthologized the, the American conservatism from 1945 on. And it does take on that character of uh, some of the you know, Soviet reactionaries, but also some of these po um, pre, you know, used to be communist, post-communist um, uh, thinkers who, um, you know, eventually defected from their old beliefs. But um, understanding this period is really fundamental for us, um, not just as Americans, but I think for conservatives especially. So maybe you could begin by framing this late 19th century, early 20th century period um, in Imperial Russia and what was reaching a, a boil, boiling point at this moment in time that set the stage for someone like Lenin. Yeah, um, I'll just go a little diversion first because, you know, I think you correctly say that um, American conservatism in the 20th century, you know, was was strongly based on anti-communism because of a modern day Russian conservatism would not be because a modern day Russian conservatism would um, see positive things in the Soviet Union and wish to to conserve those. So therefore, you you have an immediate distinction between what an American conservative would believe and what a, what a Russian conservative would believe, at least now. As, as for your your question, um, I mean, essentially the late 19th century, the very end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, was a period of, of very considerable, very rapid um, economic growth and, and social change, um, which led to um, a whole loads of stresses in, in, in Tsarist society and um, different elements of that society had essentially different solutions to, to the stresses. So the revolutionaries thought, in essence, that you should exploit the stresses to um, inaugurate a new order. Liberals thought you should um, adapt the model of Russian um, government to sort of copy the West, essentially. I mean, that, that's the sort of models they, they had in mind, Western European liberal democracy, as it was in around 1900, which is, of course, not, not quite the same as today. Um, conservatives, by contrast, were, were not... You know, when they weren't for the most part against, you know, economic progress, um, industrialization and so on, but they, they did believe that this needed a very steady hand, you might say, um, and that the, the strong hand of the state was needed to, to maintain control in, in this period of stress and, and that you needed to um, move forward in a way which was congruent with, um, you might say, existing um, existing traditions, so you you needed to maintain loyalty to the state and to the czar. You needed to maintain orthodoxy as a, some sort of glue which which held Russian society together, and you should you know um, try and base your um, economic. As far as conservatives had economic uh, projects, it was should be based on the countryside and rather than industrializing on the basis of foreign capital. Um, you should have a more sort of demand-driven um, economic growth arising from, from the peasantry, um, which would also involve not having too many disruptions to the institutes of the peasant economy, above all sort of the peasant commune and so on. There, there were differences, though. I mean, obviously different people had, had, had different attitudes, and, and you, you do get um, you know, a statist liberal conservatism arising just before the revolution associated with people like Prime Minister Stalipin, who... who um, essentially um, sort to modernize the state but have the state take the lead in, in, in doing this. But I think that sort of gives you a very sort of broad sketch of the situation as, as it then was and, and what perhaps differentiated conservatives from others. But you should, you should bear in mind, um, of course, that in, in the Russian context, which is conservatism at the time as it still is today would be associated to a certain degree with um, if not anti-Westernism, then at least um, the concept that um, the solution doesn't rely on um, the solution to society's problems doesn't rely on just copying models from Western Europe or, or North America. So that in, in 1900, say, 
the solution doesn't lie in taking, you know, German communism, Marxism, or or in taking, you know, British or North American liberalism and, and plunking them down on Russian society, but rather the, the solution lies in existing Russian institutions, or at least in, in gradual evolution from that basis. Uh, and therefore, you, you to be a conservative back then and as, as well as back now um, does tend to mean, if if, if not anti-Westernism, and at least it, it is contrasted to Westernization, um, which is more commonly associated with, with liberals and radicals. I want to delve a little bit more on the sort of modernization or Westernization theme or tension, because I know in Russian history, there's various poles between more pro-Westernizing forces and some of these anterior, these more, uh, maybe you'd say just russifying, just maintaining the uh, strong Russian identity of Russia as opposed to moving with the rest of Europe. And that's something that we see very strongly, I think, right now, not just because of the war, but even sort of there's, you have the, even before the invasion of Ukraine, you have the NATO bloc that represents Western Europe broadly. And then you have Russia's a little bit on its own. But I mean, in the history of Europe, Russia is a major European power um, and they are part of the history and the culture of Europe in some senses. So I'd love to hear more about what differentiates Russia from the rest of Europe um, and where how it finds itself historically, as well as today, if you if that's uh, if you think that's relevant in your answer. Well, I mean, it, it's 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 a question that, of course, Russian conservatives have had to deal with, because if they say we shouldn't sort of blindly copy Western models, then they have to have some idea of what, what the alternative is and therefore what, what it is that differentiates um, Russia from the West. And the first people really to um, philosophize this in a sophisticated manner were the, the Slavophiles, which was a fairly small group of philosophers operating in, in the 1840s um, and, and onwards. Um, and um, essentially, you could say that the, the root is in orthodoxy. So the, the difference between Russia and um, what they would call the um, Germano-Roman world is that um, that had its um, Germano-Roman culture originated in Catholicism, whereas um, Russian culture originated in, in Orthodoxy, um, which, um, at least certainly according to, to Slavophile thought, um, meant that um, rationalism um, came to play much larger role in Western society because the early Catholic Church um, essentially fused what you might call pagan reason, you know, Aristotle and so on, with, with, with uh, Christianity, whereas the Orthodox Church, the Sarvophiles argued, you know, ne never did this. Uh, and that therefore, um, according to Sarvophile theory, um, Russia um, retained a more spiritual outlook, right? Um, Western philosophy became one-sided. That's to say, it was it became overly rationalistic, materialistic, um, and um, whereas uh, Russian philosophy retained um, it, it didn't abandon reason, but it it, it uh, retained um, faith and tradition and and, and so on um, as well. Uh, and the Sarvatars also came up with this idea of subordinates, which is an sort of untranslatable word, which um, is really a sort of collective consensus. It's where, where a society operates according to uh, a freely agreed consensus, which is made possible by some sort of common value system, namely primarily orthodoxy. And but this is embodied, they argued, in, in the peasant commune, but more broadly in, in, in Russian society. And these sort of ideas have, um, you know, since, since spread and become, you know, fairly, fairly commonplace in an argument that um, basically, and this, this has been a very common argument from the 1840s almost right up to today, that Western society is, is rationalistic, individualistic, materialistic, whereas Russian society has, has um, a different spirit. It's, it's more collectivist. It's more operates more according to tradition and, and, and faith. Um, it has um, um, a greater sense of, of what philosopher Solovyov called Siedinsa, or unity, but of the of the unity of everything, man and God, man and earth, faith and reason, um, and therefore a wholeness of spirit uh, and all unity, which the West is allegedly lacking. 
So really the, the um, distinguishing feature of Russia is, is said to be spiritual rather than material, I think, essentially. If I could get a quick follow-up in as well. I mean, American conservatives, when we are, make arguments, some arguments we'd make would be like an argument from history, an argument from tradition. Um, and I, and it's so sort of going running with the theme that you're just talking about. How far back do you go? How far back is relevant? Because I, that's, I guess, where you, the sort of argument comes in is like at what point or where in our history, just sort of thinking for the American context for a second, like where in our history is relevant to where we are now okay. so that can sort of inform us. What about for Russia? How well, far um, back do you go famous where things are relevant? Early, mid-19th century conservative Russian historian Mikhail Pogodin came up with what was called the, the Norman theory of history, which was a slight adaptation of a, of a um, historical thesis put forward by a Frenchman called Thierry. Um, um, and essentially, it's a Norman theory of history because Russia was originally uh, medieval Rus in around 1000 was taken over by um, Vikings, so Normans. Right. And according, according to Pagodin, um, which was then an argument taken up by, by Slavophiles and so on, the, the, the origins of the difference between Russia and the West came in, in the nature of, of the Norman takeover, because he said that the, the, the Vikings were not conquerors, they were invited. Right. Um, and this meant that there was never... Um, a very sharp division between the rulers and, and ruled in the way there was, for instance, elsewhere, where, um, for instance, in, in England, the, the Normans conquered the place, right? And this meant that there was a, an ethnic divide between the rulers and the ruled, right? There were, diff were different groups. There, the, 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 there were Normans in charge and, and Englishmen underneath. And this um, ethnic division in time grows into essentially a class division, um, leading to a, a society which is, is riven by, by divisions of this sort. Whereas um, in Russia, this, this was never the case. This was his argument. Um, I think it's, it's not a very strong argument, but, but um, essentially he, he, he took um, the origins of this difference right back to around, um, you know, 1000 AD or so, um, adding in other features which made Russia difference, you know, due to the fact of geography, climate and so on, which oblige Russia to essentially have a collectivist uh, form of economic um, development because you, you had to work collectively um, in, in, in the particular climatic and geographic conditions of, of Russia. Um, but you, you can, if you want, take this back a very long time. And, and, and it's not just Russian conservatives who've done this. Um, Western historians who are critical of Russia have sometimes done this too. So Richard Pipes, for instance, um, in, in his works, um, similarly, like drew drew lessons about the difference of Russia dating back to, to the, the arrival of, of, of the Vikings um, and saying that, you know, they were just different from the beginning and, and, and they're not like us. So um, I'm not sure it's desperately good argumentation, but that's that's where that's how far back people do take it. Gotcha. And of course, you can go back to um, the schism between the um, Catholic and Orthodox churches as well as another, another key turning point. And another key turning point would be uh, 900 and whenever it was, when um, uh, the uh, Prince Vladimir of Kiev adopted Orthodoxy. So that's seen as a decisive point at which the Russia's rulers decided to adopt the Byzantine model, not the uh, Catholic model. On the, the point of Slavophilia, um, especially conservatives, when we're framing our thinking about the Russian Revolution is um, obviously the seminal text by Edmund Burke, the reflections on the French Revolution. And obviously the, the French Revolution seemed to be a huge influence in the Russian Revolution. Um, I mean, there was, it, at least my reading of it was, um, there was a Slavophilia among many Russians at the time, um, but there was also a Francophilia, it seemed, among some of the revolution-minded, and um, perhaps they wanted a model themselves off of the French Jacobins, and uh, while trying to avoid the the, um, the failure of the Paris Commune, which was in more recent memory, um, but a lot of them seemed to spend so much time in exile um, outside of Russia itself, some in, um, in Paris, and uh, it, it seemed like what were or what were the ways that the French ideals of the revolution 
were perhaps an influence or inspiration for the Bolsheviks and even the Russian intelligentsia, which if I remember correctly, um, not all were on board with um, the more radical minded, uh, you know, Russian revolutionaries, um, the Bolsheviks. And it seemed like uh, the Russian iteration of the revolution, even though they did draw inspiration from um, the, the French, you know, the, the Jacobins, it ended up being um, a lot more gruesome and savage. And I recall reading um, uh, some letters that I think Maxim Gorky was writing. Um, and he was, it seemed more aligned with kind of the, the socialist Russian intelligentsia, just reflecting on the, the brutality that ended up being the revolution. So, what are the parallels between these two historical events? Um, well, Russian revolutionaries um, looked very closely at the French Revolution and again, at the, as you mentioned, the Paris Commune. And um, primarily they, they were concerned with um, what went wrong and trying to avoid the same things going wrong again, which is kind of ironic, actually, <laughs> um, in that, um, you know, they were you know, deeply concerned with, you know, Bonapartism uh, and how um, the revolution would be, um, would descend, would eat its own and, and descend into violence and then be usurped by a dictator, um, which was one reason they, they got rid of Trotsky because they, they regarded him as, as um, being, you know, the likely Bonaparte. And, um, and they thought that Stalin was a relatively safe, safer pair of hands. And of course, it, did, didn't, it didn't work out that way. Um, so it's kind of ironic that they were, you know, continually referring to the French Revolution and, and, and um, the things which had gone wrong and how, how they needed to avoid it. But in the end, they kind of succumbed um, to the same, you know, you might say inevitable revolutionary logic. Um, on the whole, um, I, I, I tend to think that um, probably German philosophy has tended to be had a stronger influence on, on, on Russian thinking, both both radicals and conservatives, probably even when French philosophy. Um, so, um, you know, the conservatives were strongly influenced by German romanticism, um, while, of course, radicals were, were strongly influenced by, by Hegel, um, as, as were Russian liberals too. Russian liberals in the 19th century were very strongly influenced by Hegel. Um, so names like, you know, Herder, Schelling, Marx, Hegel, these, these tend to be um, uh, higher up on the reading list, perhaps than, than French, certainly English philosophy. I mean, um, one doesn't see an awful lot of references to, to Burke, for instance, even though perhaps, you know, Russian conservatives end up taking a rather similar attitude, but it's, it's, not, it's not top on the reading list. What about uh, the state of Russian philosophy at the time? Who are some of the big names, or is it more the Russian philosophers are in large part working on or focusing on what's going on in Germany, which is not, un, not unlike what's happening, what, what, what was happening in the time in America in some places. Um, well, I mean, obviously the, the slower files of the 1840s, 50s, people like Khomyakov, Kiryevsky, uh, um, Konstantin Oksakov, uh, um, very influential. Um, and then um, in the, um, you know, later period, late um, revolutionary, late, sorry, late um, pre-revolutionary period, um, there are, you know, a number of different currents of thought, the, you what you might call the more sort of reactionary um, name people would come up with would be Pabira Nosef, who was the sort of minister in charge of the uh, religious affairs in, in the um, Russian uh, Federation, uh, Russian Empire, and, and who taught, um, both the emperors Alexander III and, and, and Nicholas II, um, and was um, deeply, deeply conservative and, and really believed in, um, well, it wasn't really didn't believe in progress, but he, he felt it should be glacially slow, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, and um, then there's what you might call the, the liberal conservatives, who particularly... Um, this would be like silver age, as it's called in Russia. So these sometimes get lumped in as liberals, sometimes as conservatives. They, they often began as, um, well, some of them began as Marxists and then, then became liberals and then became conservatives. So people like Sergei Bogarkov, um, who, who was originally a Marxist economist and then a liberal member of parliament and then a, um, finally became a, a conservative theologian in exile. And similarly, uh, 
people like Nikolai Berdyaev or Piotr Struve, these, these are the sort of um, liberal conservative strand, famously associated with a, a book called Viechi, which came out in 1909 and was a uh, vituperative attack on the intelligentsia and, and saying that, you know, the problem with Russian, basically the problem with Russia was it, its intelligentsia, which was utterly maximalist, um, utterly utilitarian, uh, and believed in all these big words like, you know, liberalism or socialism, but never had any concept of what liberty was for and, and was completely ungrounded in any set of particularly religious values. Um, so it was those, those sort of people. Um, a little earlier, there are also um, journalists such as Mikhail Katkov, um, who would be the sort of nationalist strand, sort of Russia for the Russians type person who, um, again, began, a, began as a liberal and then following the, the Polish revolt of 1863 became very nationalist and, and decided that uh, basically in, in the modern era, um, a, a nation needed to have, well, needed to be like ethnically, religiously, culturally unified. Um, and that therefore, you know, Russia needed to purge itself of, of, of foreign elements to a certain degree and, and Russified Baltic states and, and Poland and, and, and so on and so forth. So those are the sort of various different trends you might have um, within conservative thought. I'm very, I'd say very, very roughly speaking. Uh, <laughs> and you mentioned the Russian intelligentsia. Where does Marx come into play? Um, we also were you know, talking about some of the German philosophers because it seemed like Lenin wasn't orchestrating this ideologically pure read of Marx, even though I think maybe a reductivist view would say, you know, someone who hasn't quite Marxist Leninism just seems like its own beast. And um, wh whereas I think my reading was that he viewed Marx, the, you know, the purely Marxist read as being more passive, whereas, um, you know, he was prioritizing this revolutionary vanguard um, so how much was Marx actually influential to the Bolsheviks? Um, I, he certainly was, but was this more of a, a catalyst? Was it um, to get things kind of brewing or um, is there, are there common misperceptions about that influence? Um, well, and Marxism arose quite reasonably late in, in, in Russia. So it's not really till the 1880s and 90s you, you begin to get people calling themselves um, Marxists um, more popular until then was, was what was called populism, which um, really looked at sort of the peasantry um, as being the um, the source of revolution in Russia. Um, and there was some logic for that in that there wasn't really much of a, a, an urban working class until um, until that time. Um, and and what Marx gives uh, Russian revolutionaries. Um, is this philosophy of dialectical material, historical and dialectical materialism, which tells you that, you know, this is inevitable, basically, but, but history is on your side and, and this will happen. Um, and this uh, philosophy of historical and dialectical materialism is, is utterly fundamental to um, Soviet ideology. So in, in 1937, when... Um, I think it's 37, sometime around then, when, when um, the Communist Party is, is writing a, a history of the, of the Communist Party um, for, for schools and universities and so on. Um, and this is mainly done by committee, but, but Stalin himself writes the chapter on historical and dialectical materialism because this is, this is so important that, you know, this is not, this is not something which can be, can be left of a committee. Um, because it, it, is, it is the, the core, in essence, of, of, of the legitimacy of the regime. Um, um, in later Soviet periods, the strictly Marxist understanding of, of, of um, history begins to get a little diluted in, in that so Marx said there were a certain number of social formations, the final which of one, of which, one of which was, was communism. P Soviet historians and economists and so on begin to come up with other social formations and to argue that you could have a mix of formations and, and it begins to get watered down a little bit. but. Um, right up until the end of the Soviet Union, you know, students at university have to do compulsory classes on, you know, um, historical and dialectical materialism. And, and that, although they're not reading Stalin's chapter anymore, they are reading, basically reading a, a 
a sanitized version thereof in which this idea of social formations moving one to another um, is is portrayed as you know the the, the process of history. So um, I think Marx is is is, is quite important in, in presenting this idea of a um, linear view of history as everybody marching in in the same direction towards the same common end. Um, yeah, one of my favorite books is Charles Malick's uh, Man and the Struggle for Peace and. It's a book about the United Nations, but one of the things, and he's writing this in the 1960s, early 1960s, after he had just, I think, finished his uh, stint as the Secretary General of the UN. And one of the sort of vignettes he points out in the book is when Kennedy met with Khrushchev, um, that might have been 61, I think. Um, and he was so struck, Kennedy was, by how self-assured that Khrushchev was, because Khrushchev just believed that his way was inevitable and it was going to take over the world. Um, so I'd love to hear more a little bit about Russia's relationship with the rest of the world in its communist phase. Um, because you were mentioning earlier, there's a sort of nationalist strain of Russia for Russia's the for Russia for Russians and Russia for itself. Um, but then there's also this part of the, the Marxist Leninist Stalinist model and Lenin, I think either during or after the uh, the Civil War in Russia, marches an army through Poland or tries to march through Poland to Germany, um, and I think Poland's able to to beat them back. But um, so there's this sort of globalist um, universal strain in uh, the as part of their as part of the historicism that this is going to take over the entire world and usher in a global utopia of some sort. Um, so what's the, I guess I'm losing the sense yeah, of well, question. Yeah, I mean, I mean but, initially the, the communists in, in after the revolution had a little bit of a problem in that um, the revolution is meant to come according to, strictly speaking, according to Marxist theory, where the contradictions in capitalist society are greatest, which implies where, you know, um, capitalism is most developed, which it wasn't in Russia. And therefore um, there were concerns that um, communism could not survive in Russia, and therefore the only way it could survive was by being exported, by sparking global revolution. And this was this is certainly the idea um, promoted by by Trotsky. But but following the, the failure of the invasion of Poland, it, it becomes obvious this this isn't going to happen. The revolution is not going to take place in Germany, um, and so Stalin comes up with the idea of socialism in one country, and from this point on, for for at least uh, until the end of Stalin's life, um, you have a more, you might say, nationalist inward looking turn. And um, Stalin gets his fingers burnt when he does try and meddle with world revolution in, in, in China, when um, Chiang Kai-shek turns, turns his back on, on, on the Communist Party and routes him in, I think, 1931 or something, about about to come up exactly. But, but, um, and that doesn't end very well. And, and, and it, it it um, confirms Stalin's belief that you really shouldn't have any dealings with um, non-communist states because they are not, even if they claim to be progressive, they will stab you in the back sooner or later. Um, this then changes under Khrushchev because you, you, you arrive in, in the era of, of decolonization and suddenly there's a whole load of um, newly independent states. And... I guess if you're going strictly according to capitalist theory, they, they need to progress through the capitalist stage before they could become communists because they're, they're obviously not yet capitalists. Um, but that's not from a point of view of foreign policy very desirable because that would then put them in, in the capitalist camp and become an ally of, of the United States. So theory gets modified a little bit and, and suddenly you, you get ideas of a very non-capitalist um, path of development, which... Um, original Russian communists such as Gorgi Plekhanov had said it was impossible. Um, but now you get the idea that national um, national governments, you know, in places like Egypt, um, by nationalizing um, industry and by um, forcing industrial development um, from the top down can, in effect, create the proletariat and, and, and then create the path for eventual socialist development without passing through the capitalist stage. Um, and this then gives you a um, 
some legitimate, legitimate, legitimation, whatever the word, um, some legitimate reason for engaging um, in alliances with these states. Um, so essentially, the, the theory is modified to allow um, alliances with, with, with the Third World, and the Soviet Union takes on the mantra of being the anti-colonial power. And to some degree, this actually connects with elements of, of, of conservative thought, um, because from, from an early point on, the sort of anti-Westernism, which I've, I've mentioned, um, does um, portray the idea of the West as being imp inherently imperialistic and colonialistic. So you, you get this expression in, in, in the early Slava files, for instance. It's then um, comes out again in the thinking of Eurasianist thinkers in, in, in the 1920s in, in exile. Um, and who are who begin to say that you know there is no single path of historical development and what, what's wrong with the west is precisely that it thinks that there is and that everybody must copy them and, and this then for leads to uh, uh colonialism and imperialism and, and, and russia should take the lead of the world and russia's mission in the world you might say is almost to um stand against this okay um and to ally with anti-colonial forces and this sort of rhetoric then, you know, gets, although it it's, has perhaps some origins and not, not in Marxist thought, it, it's, it's certainly adapted by, by, by the Communist Party for, for its own benefit. Um, and, you know, this becomes you know, Russia's global mission, essentially, to be, be the um, leader of the anti-colonial movement. And it's interesting that you, you see this rhetoric is, is reappearing in, in what's coming out of the Kremlin today, where... Um, Expressions of, of anti Westernism are very closely linked in, in a number of speeches to um, anti colonialism, and Putin will refer to Russia as the successor of the Soviet Union, will mention that the Soviet Union was the leader of the anti colonial movement. And, and these, are, these sort of things come out in, in speeches given to um, meetings, at meetings of African leaders or representatives of from, uh, you know, various uh, third world countries and so on, um, in which Russia. Um, portrays itself as, you know, um, enabling the oppressed countries of the world to stand up against uh, Western imperialism. So this is probably a loaded question, but how does the Soviet period and revolution influence the Russian identity today? Is there, like, in what way do people reflect on the Soviet era, especially? Is there this sense of, like you were just describing, the the do people buy into the idea that the Soviet Union was more or less like this protagonist of history or has that crumbled or was that more a um, like a top down thing where that was exclusive to, you know, people who were full on, you know, partisans? Um, the relationship with the Soviet past is, 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 is quite complex. Um, you know, most people don't want to go back to the Soviet Union. And I think there's a, a strong recognition that the Soviet economic model Failed, um, and also there, there is a you know there is a recognition that um, all sorts of crimes were, were committed, um, particularly in, in, in the Stalin era. Um, and, and you have you know uh, many monuments in Russia which have been, been put up at, um, to commemorate victims of Stalinism and so on. Um, and they built a big um, um, monastery, a Sretensky monastery in, in downtown Moscow, which is which is dedicated to the um, what they call the new martyrs, which is the, the Christians who were, who were killed by the, by the communist regime. Um, on the other hand, there's also a recognition that you know, the Soviet Union wasn't all bad, that the Soviet Union had many achievements to its name. It, it, it won the Second World War. Um, it uh, put the first people in space. That um, living standards um, of ordinary Russians, at least after the Second World War, did, did substantially increase. Uh, um, that... The Soviet Union did um, yeah, educate the Russian population. Um, that there were great scientific achievements by by Soviet scientists, and so on and so forth. So people recognise these, and they don't want to sort of throw a baby out with the bathwater. So um, essentially, what goes on is, is an attempt to meld all sorts of bits of history together. So you t you take what you think can be the positive bits of imp imperial history. And then you, you meld them together with what you think can be the positive bits of Soviet history, uh, and you try and then create some sort of uh, synthesis. 
Um, so you, you can have orthodoxy and Stalin together. And I've even seen icons of, of Stalin, right? You know, and, and, and this may seem kind of bizarre to us, but, 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 um, it, it, it would, it makes sense. Um, certainly, certainly to them. Um, there are, there are some among the sort of liberal intelligentsia who want to completely decommunize and say, you should get rid of everything communist and, and, and rename all the streets and tear down the Lenin statues and, and just tell everybody that communism is bad, bad, bad. But th that is not, I think, a position that is acceptable to the vast majority of the population, who, who's, many of whom's experience, particularly older generations, would, would, would say, well, come on, you know, um, things weren't that bad or whatever. So I was... Um, took some students to, to Moscow a few years back and, and we were in the, the State Duma, the Parliament, and it happened to coincide with a, um, a sort of exhibition devoted to a new museum, a museum of Soviet life. And, um, you know, one of the speakers there said, well, you know, look, we, this isn't nostalgia, but we were young then and we were happy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> back in the 70s or whatever, you know, I was young, I was happy, you know, it, 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 I, I don't think of it as so bad, right? Um... And trying to tell people that they should think of it as all bad is, isn't, isn't really going to work. So the, um, I'd say the relationship is a complex one. Um, uh, and it involves trying to take what was good out of that era and meld it with what's considered good about other eras. So as a conservative, I have to ask, is there any affection among your average Russian for the Romanovs? I mean, is there, are they viewed as, um, like, is the, obviously there were, uh, abuses and you know it was autocracy but um the bolsheviks seem to have done a pretty effective job of framing them as such but they were also the romans were brutally murdered is there any sense of affection for them um obviously in the orthodox church perhaps but uh among your average russian is that something that they have a you know the same sort of um feeling of endearment like they would towards maybe their, you know, younger years in the Soviet Union? Um, I mean, it's a monarchism is, is, is very, I mean, at, at monarchism per se is, is very much a minority viewpoint. Um, it is strong in, in, in the, in, in the Orthodox church for sure. And, and the Orthodox church has, has canonized the last czar and so on. So, um, for the average Russian, um, well, you probably have to ask them, but it, it's, I'd say it's probably just somewhat indifference. I mean, it, 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 it was long ago. It, it was, you know, it was that last czar was, you know, he wasn't a bad man the way the com I wouldn't imagine most people would regard him as a bad man in the way the communist told them, right? Um, and they would probably regard his, you know, fate as unfortunate. But at the same time, it's not like, Wow, I'm a monarchist, you know, whatever. So, so, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it happened. I think would probably be, be be the attitude towards it. That that was then. This is now. Um, you know, the Tsars did some good things. They did some bad things. You know, let's let's let's, let's take the, let's take let's remember the good stuff. And um, you know, I mean, you know, Nicholas II and, and, and Tsars tend to be you know reasonably positively portrayed. Um, I've been reading recently some biographies of Alexander III, who, who tends to be regarded as a, you know, um, inveterate reactionary in the West. And um, these modern Russian biographies, you know, think he's the bee's knees, because uh, <laughs> he, <laughs> precisely because he was conservative. So you know, I, I think attitudes will vary to who you talk to, but it, it's um, there's certainly no negativity, um, but it's not adulation either. Paul, I'm wondering what you think about how the 90s, this, or in the immediate aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Russian communist government, um, the the Yeltsin government, sort of shock therapy, Mary, various moves towards perhaps westernization or liberalizing the economy, um, you know, selling off various state assets. I'm wondering what you think that does to Russian society in general, but also what that does to Russian conservatism. Um, in this maybe more liberal pro-Western moment in the, right in the aftermath of the defeat of communism? Well, the 1990s are almost universally regarded as an absolute catastrophe. Um, one, one could argue that this is, you know, perhaps unfair, but there were some, some, some achievements and the, the, the later economic prosperity, relative economic prosperity of Russia um, owed something to, 
to the reforms which were undertaken in that era, and but it was an era of at least you know, some relative freedom of expression and so on. But but most Russians look at it and regard it as an era of of, of humiliation of. of um, enormous um, social degradation of, of mass poverty, hyperinflation, um, as an era of um, enormous uh, crime, of um, social problems, so declining um, life expectancy, collapse in social services, alcoholism, increasing drug use, organized crime, um, a corrupt and incompetent government. Um, which robbed the people of, of its property and, and, and sold it off for a pittance to, to its friends who became billionaires overnight. Um, and an era in which Russia's interests were um, ignored by pro-Western liberals who ran the show and sold Russia out to the West, one might say. These are the sort of general tropes which exist and I, w I would say are, are accepted by the majority of people in, in Russia. Um, and um, the result, of course, is, is a general, um, um, you might say, discrediting of, of liberals and liberalism uh, and of Westernism. Um, so it, it, it has been argued that contemporary Russian conservatism owes, owes a lot of its force precisely to the negative attitudes people have towards liberalism and the West as a result of what happened um, in the 1990s. Um, and that this is um, a barrier which will be always extremely hard for anyone to overcome who, who wants to call themselves a liberal. Um, liberal has become a, a, a very um, dirty word, one might say. So, um, you know, if you are a liberal, you're probably better off calling yourself something else. Um, and um, there's also, of course, this has been exacerbated by um, certain um, um, behaviors of the West on, on the international scene. The uh, bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999 was, was a major turning point for, for, many, for many people whose, um, you might say, illusions about the West as, as, as a peaceful... Um, body were, were, were shattered and of course you know the invasion of Iraq and the Maidan revolution a whole, a whole succession of, of, of things we, we have done which have then um, exacerbated anti-Westernism um, and therefore you might say strengthened the, the, the conservative turn in, in Russian society. So we're starting to wind down as we run out of time unfortunately but I wanted to ask about um, some of the great writers and thinkers that uh, we especially treasure as um, conservatives and Americans. And I ISI especially, these are um, thinkers like, um, you know, Solzhenitsyn, Whitaker, Chambers that our students regularly read. And a lot of these people, you know, who we who treasure, we've read, um, you know, their, their writing, um, there are people who have been, you know, perhaps ex-communists. There are people who have been subjected to some of the, uh, you know, the, the gulags um, and some of the other uh, horrors of the Soviet Union. Um, some have even been spies <laughs> before defecting. Could you explain this phenomenon of, you know, these um, ex-communists, but also, um, you know, people like Solzhenitsyn who... Um, were you know at one point uh, you know in in Soviet Russia itself, and um, then became kind of part of the mythology of American conservatism in a sense. Um, is there like what was kind of the, um, the the background for you don't have to go into specifics of these two writers, but um, there's there's many of them out there that um, have become like staples of um, of our literary canon. Yeah, well, to be being against the the Russian state doesn't necessarily make you pro Western or pro liberal. One one might be against the Russian state um, for for many reasons, and in fact, you, if you read my book on Russian conservatism, you, you'll you'll see that in fact, um, conservative philosophy in Russia has often been quite um, not hostile to the state per se, but certainly hostile to state policy, and state because mm -hmm. state policy is often seen as modernizing and westernizing. Uh, and you get a, a strong conservative reaction against it, right? Um, so uh, someone like Solzhenitsyn is um, strongly opposed to, to the Soviet state, 
but that doesn't mean that he, he's um, pro-Western in the slightest. Um, and of course, his Harvard speech is, is you know, a, a um, you might say, a canonical text of, 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 of Russian conservatism. In, 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 in it says, "Look, you know, okay, so Union sucks, but you know, you, you, you suck too." <laughs> and um, you know, there's more. You, you know, there's more to life than individualism, rationalism, and, 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 and materialism, and, and, and um, you know, we may we may have dictatorship, but at least we have you know the Russian soul or, or whatever. And you get other examples later, like um, Alexander Zinoviev, um, who um, was um, you know a, a Russian philosopher, a Soviet philosopher, who, who was um, expelled. Um, but when he came to the United States, he, he didn't really much like what he what he saw. Um, and actually, this is this is not an this is not uncommon uncommon thing. And in fact, if you go back in the history of, of, of Russian conservatism, it's very interesting that many of the most anti-Western writers are, are people who are thoroughly Westernized, who, who've traveled in the West, been educated in the West, have, have speak multiple Western languages. I mentioned Pavier Nosev. I mean, he spoke, I can't remember how many Western languages, always took his holidays in Italy and, and, and so on. And, and the, the, the Slavophiles had been in university in, in Germany and they, you know, they, they, they were up to their ears in German philosophy, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, Dostoevsky, you know, used to like going gambling in, in Baden-Baden and so on. Um, <laughs> these are, in many respects, fairly Western people. Um, but nonetheless, they, you know, they always understood the West as being somewhere different. So Russian emigres who were thrown out of the Soviet Union in, in the early 1920s, soon after the revolution, you know, they never felt at home in Western Europe. And they always thought, you know, that they were in an alien society who didn't like them very much. Yeah. Um, and, you know, part of what they, they wrote was a, was a reaction to that. So um, I think this is, this is a long, long-standing philosophy. And one also, is, it, it's, there's, a, there's a lesson there for, for, for people in the West. Is you shouldn't assume that just because people are... Um, have differences with the, the Russian state, but they're going to be your friends. Yeah, Paul, uh, I mean, the Harvard commencement address is not just a standard for Russian conservatism, but also American conservatism, because it sort of dovetails in a very interesting way with thinkers maybe like Richard Weaver or um, I think Kirk probably less so, but, you know, Leo Strauss and other sort of um, emigrate to the United States. But these people are sounding the alarm uh, on the spiritual hollowness of the modern West, which I guess gets a little bit papered over in the culture war or in the civilizational clash in the Cold War. Um, but I mean, I, we really have not talked that much about the uh, Ukraine and Russia war. So maybe just as a closing, I'd love to hear what you think about how that how that war has what that I guess that what that bodes for the future of Russia, Russia, cons, Russian conservatism, Russia's place in the world stage, Russia's civilizational future. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, a lot depends on how how it ends. I'm, I'm not I'm not desperately optimistic about it about it ending in a way that will allow any sort of rapprochement between East and West. Um, I mean, one can't say for sure, but the the, the current. The current sort of trend in military events suggests that it's going to be extremely unlikely that Ukrainians could recapture their, their lost territory. And therefore, whatever happens at the end of this is likely to see a, a substantial amount of territory remaining in Russian hands. And this, this may not may be accepted in a peace treaty or it may not. And we may have a, like a Korean scenario where there's, there's a peace without a peace, you know, without a formal peace treaty, um, which... Is perhaps looking, you know, quite a likely scenario. And in that case, you know, you're going to have decades and decades of tension, and, and sanctions will remain on Russia for for a very long time, and, and even cultural exchanges will be minimised. Uh, and the situation now is, is worse than it was during the height of a Cold War, in, in that at least from the mid '50s onwards, you know, we had ongoing cultural exchanges and people going to Russian you know, Soviet universities and them coming over here, and all that has stopped. Right, uh, um, and there's been, you know, uh, the amount of contact um, is is to some degree much much less than it was, you know, when I was young in the 1980s and was, was a student of the Soviet Union. 
And, and if, if the war in Ukraine ends in a way which does not allow for um, rapprochement and the, means that there's decades of, 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 of military standoff and fears of a renewal of the conflict, then you could well have a situation in which Russia and the West are isolated from one another for a very, very long time. And in the meantime, the, the world is changing and the power is shifting to the east. And the, you know, Russian Western liberalizing, Westernizing concept, which has looked to the West as being the model for emulation and as the inevitable model towards, towards which history will move will become harder to sustain simply because um, the West won't be number one anymore. Right. And, and, and so it will be harder to maintain this belief that you, you have to copy the West. And um, as a result, it, it, you know, it, it could be that, you know, we're in for, um, if not a permanent separation, something which is, is semi-permanent. And, and um, I'm not one of those people who thinks that Russia's, you know, I don't really buy a lot of the talk about Russia's distinctiveness and, and Russia as a separate civilization. But, it, but you know, it, it, it could move in that way if, if we are separated for 70 years or oh, oh, 80 years, I mean, um, or even longer. Um, we've seen in the case of like, you know, Cuba, the United States can keep sanctions on people for a very, very, very long time, <laughs> even if it's having zero effect. Um, so there's no particular reason why the same policy might not be applied to Russia. And, and, and then, um, you know, Russians of, of many generations will be brought up um, yet again on, on a diet of, of anti-Westernism, but in, in a world which, in which the West is no longer number one, uh, and that could have um, quite significant long-term consequences. Well, it does certainly seem to be where it's headed, at least at the moment. Things could change at you know, the drop of a hat, but who knows yeah. what the future holds. Well, Paul, we are out of time. Um, this has been a great episode. I've really enjoyed listening to hear you to tell us about the history of, of Russia, the state of conservatism. So thank you so much for being with us. If people want to read your books, see what you're doing on a, you know, on a more uh, daily basis, where should they look for you? Where can they find you? Um... Well, I used to run a blog, but I, I've stopped it a couple of years ago. Um, but, um, I mean, if you just Google me, I'm sure a lot of my books and some will, will, will pop up. <laughs> the last few books have been published by Cornell University Press. So if you go on their website, you'll see the last um, last three books. And there's a, there's a fourth one coming out soon as well. And I write um, once a month for Canadian Dimension magazine. So... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had a, an article for them on um, the anniversary of Lenin's death. So um, you, you can um, you can see me there once a month. All right. Well, we can plug that in our show notes. So thanks again, Paul. Okay. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our website at isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age articles, debates, lectures, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.